one, the shadow in the chimney. It was thunder in the air on the night I went to the deserted mansion atop Tempest Mountain to find a lurking fear. I was not alone, for full hardness was not then mixed with that love of the grotesque and the terrible which had made my career quest a series of quests for strange horrors in literature, literature and in life. With me, there were two faithful and muscular men for whom I had sent when the time came. Men long associated with me in my ghastly explorations because of their peculiar fitness. We started from the village because of the reporters who still lingered about after the Eldritch panic of a month before. The nightmare kept creeping death. Later, I thought they might aid me, but I did not want them then. What to God I had let them share the search that I might not have had to bear the secret alone so long. To bear it alone for fear of the world would call me mad or go mad at itself at the demon implications of the thing. Now that I'm telling it anyway, lest the breeding made me a maniac, wish I never had never concealed it. For I, and only I, know what manner of fear lurked on that spectral and desolate mountain. In the motor car, a small motor car, we covered the miles of primeval forest and hill until the wooded ascent checked it. The country bore an aspect more than usually sinister. As we viewed it by night and without the custom crowds of investigators so that we were often tempted to use the acetylene headlight despite the attention it might attract. It was not an unwholesome landscape after dark and I believe I would have noticed its morbidity even if I hadn't been ignorant of the terror that stalked there. Of wild creatures, there were none. They were wise and when death leaders close. The ancient lightning strikes scarred trees. Seemed unnaturally large and twisted. And the other vegetation unnaturally thick and feverish. While curious mounds of hummocks in the weedy, fulgurite pitted earth reminded me of snakes and dead men's skulls swelled to gigantic proportions. Fear had lurked on Tempest Mountain for more than a century. This I learned at once from newspaper accounts of the catastrophe which first brought the region to its for to world notice. The places of remote, lonely elevation on that part of the, the Catskills where Dutch civilization once feebly and transient, transiently penetrated, leaving behind as it receded only a few ruined mansions and a degenerate squatter population inhabiting pitiful hamlets on isolated slopes. Normal beings seldom visited the locality till the local police were formed, and even now only infrequent troopers would patrol it. The fear, however, is an old tradition throughout the neighboring villages, since it is a prime topic in the simple discourse of the poor mongrels who sometimes leave their valleys and trade hand-woven baskets for such primitive necessities as they cannot shoot, raise, or make. The lurking fear dwelt in the shunned and deserted Martens mansion, which crowned the high but gradual eminence whose liability to frequent thunderstorms gave it the, the name of Tempest Mountain. For over a hundred years, the antique grove-circled stone house had been the subject of stories incredibly wild and monstrous, monstrously hideous. Stories of a silent, colossal, creeping death which stalked abroad in summer. With whimpering insistence, the squatters told tales of a demon which seized long wayfarers after dark. 
either carrying them off or leaving them in a frightful state of gnawed dismemberment, while sometimes they whispered of blood trails toward the distant mansion. Some said the thunder caught a lurking fear out of its habitation, whilst others said that thunder was its voice. No one outside the backwoods had believed these varying and conflicting stories with, with their incoherent and extravagant descriptions of the half-glimpsed fiend. Yet not a farmer or a village doubted that the Martens mansion was ghoulishly haunted. Local history forbade such a doubt, although no ghostly evidence was ever found by such investigators as had visited the building after some especially vivid tale of the squatters. Grandmothers told strange myths of the Martens specter. Myths concerning the Martens family itself, its queer hereditary dissimilarity of eyes, its long unnatural annals, and the murder which caused, which cursed it. The terror which brought me to the scene was a suddenly and portentous confirmation of the mountaineers' wildest legends. One summer night after a thunderstorm of the pre unprecedented violence, the countryside was aroused by a squatter stampede which no mere delusion could create. The pitiful thro throngs of natives shrieked and whined with the, the unnameable horror which had descended upon them. And they were not doubted. They had not seen it, but had heard such cries from one of their hamlets that they knew a creepy death had come. In the morning, citizens and state troopers followed the shuddering mountaineers to the place where they said the death had come. Death was indeed there. The ground under the, one of the squatter's villages had caved in after a lightning stroke, destroying several of the malodorous shanties. But upon this property, damage was superimposed and organic devastation which paled it to insignificance. Of a possible 75 natives who had inhabited the spot, not one living specimen was visible. The disordered earth was covered with blood and human debris bespeaking too vividly the ravages of demon teeth and talons, yet no visible trail led away from the carnage. That some hideous animal must be the cause, everyone quickly agreed, nor did anyone, any tongue now revive the charge that such cryptic deaths formed merely the sordid murders common in decadent communities. That charge was revived only when about 25 of the estimated population were found missing from the dead. And even then it was hard to explain the murder of 50 by half of that number. But the fact remained that on a summer night, a boat had come out of the heavens and left the dead village whose corpses were horribly mangled, chewed and clawed. The excited countryside immediately connected with the horror with the haunted man Mark Tent's mansion, though the localities were over three miles apart. The troopers were more skeptical, including the mansion only casually in their investigations, and dropping out altogether when they found it thoroughly deserted. Country and village people, however, canvassed the place with infinite care, overturning everything in the house, sounding ponds and brooks, beating down bushes and ransacking nearby forests. All was in the vein. The death had come, had left no trace save the destruction itself. By the second day of the search, the affair was fully treated by the newspapers, whose reporters overran Tempest Mountain. They described it in much detail and with many inter interviews to elucidate the horror's history as told by local grandams. I followed the accounts languidly at first, for I am a connoisseur in horrors. But after a week, I just detected an atmosphere which disturbed me oddly. So that on August 5th, 1921, I registered among the reporters who crowded the hotel at Leffert's Corners, nearest village to Tempest Mountain, and acknowledged headquarters of the searchers. Three weeks more, and the dispersal of the reporters left me free to begin a terrible exploration. 
based on the minute inquiries and surveying with which I had mean while busied myself. So on this summer night, while distant thunder rumbled, I left a silent motor car and tramped with two armed companions up the last mound covered reaches of Tempest Mountain. Catching the beams of an electric torch on the spectral gray walls that began to appear through giant oaks ahead. In this morbid night solitude and feeble shifting illumination, the vast box-like pile displayed obscure hints of terrors which day could not uncover. Yet I did not hesitate, since I had come with fierce resolution to test an idea. I believed that the thunder had called the death demon out of some fearsome secret place. And be that demon solid entity or va vaporous pestilence, I meant to see it. I had thoroughly searched my there were room before, hence knew my plan well, choosing as the seat of the, my vigil the old room of Jan Markens. whose murder loomed so great in the rural legends. I felt subtly that the apartment of this ancient victim was best for my purposes. A chamber measuring about 20 feet square contained, like the other rooms, some rubbish which had been once been furniture. It lay on the second story on the southeast corner of the house and had an immense east window, narrow south window, both devoid of panes or shutters. Opposite the large window was an enormous Dutch fireplace with scriptural tiles representing the prodigal son, and opposite the narrow window was a spacious bed built into the wall. As the tree muffled thunder grew louder, I arranged my plan's details. First, I fastened side by side the, to the ledge of the large window three rope ladders which I had brought with me. I knew they had reached a suitable spot on the grass outside, for I attested them. Then the three of us dragged from another room a wide four-poster bedstead, crowding it laterally against the window, having strewn it with fur bows, all now rested on it with drawn automatics. Two relaxing while the third watched. From whatever direction the demon might come, our potential escape was provided. If it came from within the house, we had the window ladders. If from outside, do the door and the stairs. We did not think, judging from precedent, that it would pursue us far even at worst. I watched from midnight to one o'clock, when in spite of the sinister house, the unprotected window, and this approaching thunder and lightning, I felt singularly drowsy. I was between my two companions, George Bennett, being towards the window, and William Toby towards the fireplace. Then it was asleep, having apparently felt the same anomalous drowsiness which affected me. So I designated Toby for the next watch, although he even he was nodding. It is curious how intently I had been watching that fireplace. The increasing thunder must have affected my dreams, for in the brief time I slept there came to me apocalyptic visions. Once I partly awaked, probably because of the sleeper towards the window had flung, restlessly flung a, an arm across my chest. I was not sufficiently awake to see whether Toby was attending to his duties as sentinel, but I felt a distinct anxiety on that score. Never before had the presence of the evil so poignantly oppressed me. Later, I must have dropped to sleep again, for I was out of this phantasmal chaos that my mind leaped when the night grew hideous, with shrieks beyond anything in my former experience or imagination. And that shrieking in the inmost soul, in human fear and agony clawed hopelessly and insanely at the agony gates of oblivion. I awoke to red madness and the mockery of diabolism. 
as farther and farther down the inconceivable vistas that phobic and crystalline anguish retreated and reverberated. There was no light, but I knew from the empty space at my right that Toby was gone. God alone knew whither. Across my chest still lay the heavy arm of the sleeper at my left. Then came the devastating strokes of lightning which shook the whole mountain. Lit the darkest crypts of the hoary grove and splintered the patriarch, patriarch of the twisted trees. In the demon flesh, flash of a monstrous fireball, the sleeper started up suddenly while the glare from beyond the window threw his shadow vividly up the chimney. Above the fireplace from which my eyes had never strayed. That I am still alive and insane is a marvel I cannot fathom. I cannot fathom it, for the shadow on that chimney was not of that of George Bennett or of any other human creature, but a blasphemous abnormality from hell's nethermost craters. A nameless, shapeless abomination which no mind could fully grasp or no pen could even partly describe. In another second, I was alone in the, the full the accursed mountain and shivering and gibbering. George Bennett and William Toby had left no trace, not even of a struggle. They were never heard of again. <laughs>